Hello, Britlet scholars and former Play-Doh eaters. I'm Mr. Osborne, and this is your unit preview. Hang on to your scruples, because here comes the Victorian age, an era of industry and expansion when the sun never set on the British Empire. What a wondrous, glorious oh, time. Mr. Osborne. Isn't all that glorious empire stuff just propaganda for England's ruthless colonization and abuse of countries they considered to be less civilized? Wow, that was a thoughtful and well-phrased question. I'm going to ignore it. Onward to victory! Seven years after Queen Anne oversaw the merger between England and Scotland as Great Britain, she died without an heir. I really wish royals would stop doing that. So the line of succession dictated that the country go to the Germans. George of the Germans, to be precise. Great-grandson of King James I and the first of four Georges to reign from the British House of Hanover. They should have kept it a trilogy. George IV, Return of the George? Way too commercial. But by the early 19th century, Hanover was running out of Georges, and once again it looked like the British line of succession might be at an end. <sighs> until Victoria was born, and the country breathed a collective sigh of relief. <sighs> Since she became queen at age 18 and lived to be 81, Victoria's reign is the longest in British history, and as long as Elizabeth II gives up the throne sometime soon, nope. it'll stay that way. Though British colonization began long before Victoria came to power, the empire is widely considered to have reached its zenith while she was queen. Britain had colonies in India, Africa, Australia, Canada, and a timeshare in the Hamptons where they liked to spend the summer months. British subjects were often fed propaganda and I told you! Yes, you're very smart. Stop talking. British subjects were often fed propaganda in support of colonization and empire building. Images like this one were common, depicting a benevolent maternal figure of Britannia looking distinctly Roman and welcoming her foreign subjects. They in turn look eager to join her and offer up their country's most valuable goods in service to their colonizer. The truth was that Britain's colonies were taken by military force, robbed of their resources, and often left in terrible poverty. These types of cartoons, articles, and speeches serve to distract the people of Britain from the evils of the empire. D did none of these people ever see Star Wars? Wars. Late Victorian literature such as Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness would address the issue of colonialism, but throughout most of the 19th century, novels were more concerned with domestic affairs. You are the father. Not like that. That's better. The novel was truly the literary art form du jour, and the Victorian period produced classic works by novelists such as William Thackeray, the Bronte sisters, and George Eliot, who was actually a woman writing under a male pen name, because England has more Georges than you can throw a shoe at. Too soon? And of course, I would be remiss to try and discuss Victorian novels without mentioning Charles Dickens. So there, I mentioned him. Thomas Hardy is another famous Victorian novelist who also wrote a considerable amount of poetry during his lifetime. Most of Hardy's contemporary fans wouldn't have known of his poetic skills, though, as he didn't publish any of it until 1898, 30 years into his writing career. That's kind of like if Madonna announced tomorrow that she'd be directing a movie. She did? I wish you hadn't told me that. Thankfully, Mr. Hardy's poetry is much better than Madonna's... film. For example, in The Man He Killed, Hardy expresses how unfair and senseless war can be, saying, Yes, quaint and curious war is. You shoot a fellow down, you'd treat if met where any bar is, or help to half a crown. Here, Hardy highlights how hostility hits home when we weigh the wages of warfare against average afternoons appreciated alongside amiable acquaintances. While Hardy wrote often of the modern world of war, death, and even the sinking of the Titanic, sounds like he was a bowl of sunshine and happy sprinkles, other poets looked to the past to inspire their verse. Alfred, Lord Pretentious Name, uh, Tennyson, composed his narrative poem, The Lady of Shalott, based upon the stories of Arthurian legend. Aw, I thought we were done with King Arthur. This is British literature. We're never done with Arthur. You don't like it? Move to Russia. In Shalott, the lady of the title lives under a curse that prevents her from looking out her window or leaving her home. You might know this curse as World of Warcraft. Instead, she must continually weave pictures on her loom based on the reflections of the world she sees in her mirror. Metaphorically, the Lady of Shalott can be taken to represent the world of the artist, always observing a certain version of the world and trying to recreate it while never being a real participant in it. Tennyson also wrote the poem In Memoriam, a tribute to his friend Arthur Henry Hallam, who died in 1833. In Memoriam became one of Queen Victoria's personal favorite works, as she related it to the death of her beloved husband, Prince Albert, in 1861. Oops, I just spoiled the ending of the young Victoria. Go back and unsee the last 15 seconds. But Victoria and Albert aren't the only great real-life love story of the 1800s. There was also the poetic pair of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett. Moulton. Barrett. Browning. It's complicated. Robert was six years younger than Elizabeth and started their relationship as a slightly obsessed fan of her poetry. Though they'd never met, in a letter Robert wrote to Elizabeth in 1844, he said, I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett, 
And I love you too. Creeper. But Barrett and Browning eventually met, fell in love, and became betrothed. There was just one problem. Elizabeth's father, Edward Barrett Moulton Barrett, this is ridiculous. Elizabeth's father, Edward, had eight boys and four girls and refused to let any of them get married. Why, you ask? I, I didn't. Great question. No one knows. Theories range from him simply wanting to maintain control over his children's lives to the possibility that he was uncomfortable with the idea of them <clears throat> kissing anyone. Let's just leave it at that. Whatever the weird reason was, it meant that Elizabeth and her beloved Robert had to marry in secret and abscond to Italy where they had a son, wrote poetry, and lived together happily for many years. Elizabeth's poetry collection, Sonnets from the Portuguese, chronicles the couple's courtship and includes the famed Sonnet 43, whose first line might sound familiar. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. One, two, three, Five? A billion. Though this line has become a cliche through its gross overuse, it should not diminish the original poem's impact. In the context of Robert and Elizabeth's forbidden love, the sonnet's expressions of intense passion acquire greater meaning and include the reader on a very personal level. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. That's beautiful. Excuse me. Robert went on to become a celebrated poet as well, composing works such as My Last Duchess and Porphyria's Lover. Here's an excerpt from Porphyria. That moment she was mine, mine fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. I'm sorry, that was 100% inappropriate and I Excuse me. Barry Popovich proposed that the character Porphyria might actually be the disease Porphyria, in which case strangling it would be a good thing. Thanks, Barry. Or she's a real woman the narrator strangles. Oh, come on! Can't these Brits just write happy poems? Although we'd like to idealize Victorian England as prosperous and happy, there was always a darkness lurking behind the light. 19th century authors and poets sought to capture both sides of Victorian life by weaving into their tapestries the images they beheld in their own mirrors. Tune in next time when we'll not go gentle into that good night, see who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, and find out why the Great War was neither great, nor a war, nor great. Okay, it was a war. See you then. My mom loves Charles Dickens. She's gonna kill me. Well, you're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home.